This is We Are Libertarians, and I'm your host, Dale Melch. With me is Hody Johns. Hody, how you doing today? Um, better now that I'm with you, Dale. Oh, that's that warms the heart. That warms <laughs> the heart, Hody. What are we talking about today? Uh, today we're going to talk about when to tough it out and when to ask for help, and uh, get going to get in touch with our tough side and our soft side today. And we're going to do all that in 30 minutes. So we're just going to ride the roller coaster of emotion, man. Always tough, Odie. Even even if you're asking for help, there. That's the balance. We were we were arguing off air about never asking for help versus asking for help. Which, of course, I always take the goofball extreme position just to be cute about it. But Odie, you you're the one who picked the topic, so you lead us off. Sure. So, man, I gotta tell you, I am such a fan of toughing it out, like an unbelievable fan of toughing it out. I am very. Uh, I I have a a strong identity i think people that's how they know me in the workplace as the guy who no matter how painful it gets or stressed out it gets i'm there and i'm fighting for it and we're just gonna say yeah all right i am gonna put my nose to the grinder and we're gonna make this happen i show up right. to work sick i haven't taken a sick day in the last man decade i uh i have shown up to work insanely sick i've been sent home for being sick Good. But <laughs> but I show up even when I'm sick. And so for me, I have this natural identity that just says, tough it out no matter what. You're be a man, you know, and 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 never, you know, all these weaklings that that take sick days, you know, they're they're beneath me. And I tend to have a very it, it, it was very powerful. And for me, it's been a healthy identity in some aspects. But I had a huge hindrance when it come to asking for help. Now, the reason I say toughing it out and asking for help is because I'm not throwing my entire previous ideology under the bus. And right. I'll get to that later. But it's important to balance that with asking for help. At the same time, and I guess we'll talk about it a little bit in this program, I developed some serious mental problems from never talking about my problems or never saying I was hurt or never admitting that I was having a bad day or saying it was going through my head, even to the people that I love the most and trust me, much less my work, work, you know, coworkers and colleagues, you know, it's autopiloted, you know, how are you doing today? Great. Don't even sweat me, you know, let's fight it out. And, and that's just kind of, I've had to learn to balance those. And I, I'm kind of, I'm excited slash nervous to share kind of my stories regarding that. But I mean, let's throw it back over to you. Have you found a good balance with those? Uh, any history there? Yes. Uh, do you want me to tell a story or do you want to start with the storytelling? I, I can give you the short answer, but I can tell you a story. Well, it's me talking way too much if I tell my story. So so we're going to do the nice volleyball bump set spike. I took my bump set spike. I'm going to knock it over the net your direction. And I'll, I'll use a baseball to get that uh, to get that volleyball. But what's <laughs> mixing sports with this, evidently. So um, on my I think you and I are very similar in this regard. Um, my my bio parents were were dumb people and did not have the whole you know, emotional empathy, balance of toughness. And so um, as I grew up, I was, I, I rebelled into a conservative. Now I'm not necessarily talking politics, but this went on and on. And one of the things that got me through it was constantly arguing with my dad about religion, politics, whatever. And in the midst of all of that, all that fighting, um, I didn't really notice any of the underlying issues that were cropping up. But I noticed um, as I got older and further away from actually dealing with him, and eventually he passed away in 2010, um, and of course, pledging allegiance to another family, I noticed that there was this this inner monologue that was whenever I, even if it was just a minor thing, or someone would chast, even if, it didn't even take a manager getting after me for something, if I did something and I knew it was incorrect, uh, it would just, it would be like, I was the cowering six six year old um, getting yelled at by his dad about whatever, and I, I took notice of this one day when I was. This is actually back when I was slinging pies, and I'm like, "What on earth? He's dead. Why am I still hearing him?" Or I, I think it might. Yeah, it was after he had passed away because I was I was doing the painting thing and slinging pies at night, and it was it was horrible and. I didn't know who to talk to, what what planet this was coming from, and whatever else. But it was it took time 
And it took some of the things that we've talked about, you know, how to talk to yourself to overcome some of that. And it was when I turned 35 that I managed to beat the voice out, but that was time that was going to see a therapist that was learning from people who have skill in psychology, friends that are, that are therapists that have just talked to me one-on-one. -on -one. And it, you know, not to get into, into, into too much of the, I don't want to go too deep into the weeds or steal any thunder from you, but it was, it was learning how to treat myself like someone that I'm responsible for caring about, which makes sense at the outset. But, you know, with our, with our imperfections, sometimes we give ourselves no slack. Sometimes we give ourselves too much slack, but it was coming to that realization and realizing I have to take charge of this and, you know, when appropriate and necessary, opening up to people. But that's, yeah, I don't know if that's a similar story to what you're, what you've got going on, but that, that's been, that's been part of my story for a long time. And it's taken reaching out to family and friends again, in appropriate ways. You don't necessarily want to fall apart in front of your coworkers, but, but if you don't deal with it, that's what'll happen. So Cody, I'll bump the ball back to you, man. <laughs> the, uh, or if you prefer the baseball, it's my inning, right? My half of the inning. <laughs> right. Um, the, what you said is so right. You are another person. You need to be cared for like another person. And I think and I think there's a religious element, especially where I say I put God first, everyone else second, myself last. He who puts himself last shall be first. And so I'm like, okay, I know how to put myself last. I'm good at that. All my priorities are set aside and I put everybody else before me. And yeah, I'm over here feeling like I'm doing the right thing when I'm discounting all those other equally important scripture scriptures about self-maintenance and self-care being really critical in order to take care of other people, right? And so, and it is so critical. Um, and let's, I mean, I'll just dive right into it. So I was rolling along and on the outside, I pretended I was doing okay. Uh, I went through a divorce and something that made my divorce unique was it was in the makings for a lot longer than people knew about. Mm -hmm. um, my ex had turned to drugs. She turned to other men. She turned to other women. She went nuts. And right. had filed for divorce, and clinically, I can. Was it? I'm sorry to interrupt, but, but I'm just wanting clarification. Was that clinically or just? No, I guess, and it's unfair for me to say she went nuts. And 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 in in fairness to her, and it's taken some years to talk about. You know, to, I'm not to calling kinda, you out. I'm no, not no, you're out. You, no, and that's. But it's totally fair. I mean, to be accurate, she did not go nuts. She wanted to do things like a college student, and you know, we got married young. She didn't really have her college years. And so she hit college age and wanted to be a do college stuff, sleep with everybody and try drugs and drink and go and, you know, and, and whatever. And I ne I never had that rebellious fate. I didn't get through it, go through it either. But I just right. assumed about her. This is, you know, hey, you and I are alike. Neither of us want to drink or do drugs or sleep with everybody. It's just that she hit the age when most people do it and was like, oh, now I do want to experiment with that. And I hit that age and I was like. I just passed through it. You know, I hadn't, I didn't right. have that. So I was, and I'd say like, I was more ready, but in truth, I wasn't very supportive or understanding when she would do those things. I did. I absolutely, I forgave her immediately. We never talked about it when she said, Hey, here's why I messed up. I was like, you're forgiven. Let's not even worry about it again. Uh, I didn't heal much there. This, that's a su different subject for a different time, but essentially this was happening for years before she even wow. you know before she filed for divorce and the, or i guess she filed for divorce very early i contested it i said no we're going to make this work no matter what i put all my eggs in that basket every single support mechanism i had in my life was in that basket in her i i i had no self-worth my entire sense of worth was how she saw me and she wanted nothing to do with me the problem is, is when the person that you have shared the most information with in your life says, I don't want to be a part of you anymore. That's shattering, right? Like, I don't, yes. 
that's the person who knows you better than anybody else, that you've told secrets that nobody else knows. And you want to think, man, if somebody really knew who I was, like the whole Aladdin thing, you know, if the, only they'd look closer, they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't just see a poor boy. They, they, they'd love me, right? If they just gave me another look. And that's how you think it's going to happen. But then you have this person, you share everything, they know you better than any other, and they're like, I'm kind of grossed out by you. Like, I don't, you know, I, 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 you're not worth my time. You're not worth my effort. You know, she, I, I mean, I would make plans. I mean, even in therapy, I'd schedule a therapy session and she'd miss it. And it was just like, she just was checked out. In fairness to her, she wanted out and I fought it. And it was entirely my fault for fighting it instead of just letting her be free. I did a lot of things now that I regret and I look back at. But in pertinence to this, with what matters to this particular conversation is that I tried to tough it out and I said I'm fine and I told everybody I'm fine I'm doing great don't worry about it I kept that chipper attitude that I always have most people don't know this I'm an extreme introvert um, I you do know. I do not like conversing with anybody else outside of like five people and I and, and it's it's the truth and it's sad but it's the truth and I and so I am great at faking it. I fake I faked being an extrovert, so I just did the same thing. I said, I'll fake it. I'll just pretend. Pretend I'm doing well. And that allowed a huge amount of damage to creep up in my system that it took years to repair because I refused to ask for help. And finally, it got to a really bad point. Um, I developed a really severe problem. Uh, I had a neurological disorder where my brain realizing that I had abandoned all comfort mechanisms treated pain mechanisms that would result in my death as as pleasure mechanisms and so I stuck my hand in boiling water and it felt good I yeah the, the cut yourself and it feels amazing I I thought it was something that only freaks did and then all of a sudden I was like oh because your body's telling you to kill yourself it's saying you're never going to recover. This is like an animal in the wild, right? It triggers a response. When it says you're about to be eaten or your leg's cut in a trap, it, it, you know, animals will produce these enzymes that say, okay, you know what? If you're going to die, let's give up, but let's at least make this as painless as possible or even feel good. The fainting sheep, have you seen those where people yell at them and they do like the yeah. barrel rolls and everything? It's hilarious. But basically what's going on is the neurological parts of their brains as a predator's here. You have no chance of outrunning it. You're dead meat. So what we're going to do is freeze you up, make it so that you can't move, and this is going to feel okay or not feel anything at all and so it's a kind of a freaky experience when you have that thankfully this only lasted a week but i had to go to a professional God. therapist now that only lasted a week the whole me cutting myself and being like this is amazing and like boiling my hand i mean there was some other weird stuff that i don't even want to talk about on air but it, it, i was messed up right well if you don't mind if i jump in i do want to ask a couple questions if that's okay yeah what what was it? First of all, where was your family in all of this? Um, did, did you reach out to any of them at all? And then my second question is, what snapped you out of it? So those are great questions. I'm going to answer them in the reverse order that you asked them. That's fine. <laughs> uh, I, my, I decided to take care of it the instant I, I had a car ride home. With the nature of my job, I was working with the church at the time, and they had a policy where you can't work for them. They've actually changed the policy since then, go figure, but they actually won't hire, uh, they won't keep an institute teacher's job. I was teaching institute for the LDS church, and they won't keep you around if you get divorced. So I, I lost my job when wow. I got divorced. Um, and I was teaching religion, which was what my degree is, right? So I loved it. I loved talking about it, my faith, and, and I was I thought it was a dream job. And I remember driving home and just laughing about killing myself without thinking about it. Like, just like thinking about swerving the car into another lane and just being like, it, it's one thing to like think about it and be like, oh, like, that's a bad thought, you know, which was what it was before. Like, oh, my, like, I, and I I'd thought about it before, but never I've been like, oh, that would be nasty. I remember thinking about it then that'd be like, oh, that'd be hilarious. That'd be great. You know, and and. It, wow. I And I realized when I got home, I was like, holy crap, I was laughing about that. There is something wrong with me. And um, the the reason the boiling hand thing was so interesting is uh, I got home 
I boiled probably ramen noodles because I was living a sad, lonely life. And <laughs> and uh, some of the boiling water splashed on my skin. And I realized that it felt like, best way I could say is like feathers or marshmallows or something like that. And I was like, mm. and so I dipped my fingers like in there for just a second, had the same sensation. And I was like, okay, like this is bad. And I really, one of the things that helped me through that was when I reached out and I finally talked to a therapist, they were like, oh, you're not alone. I know exactly what you're going through. And they showed me other examples. It's not common. I mean, it's like something that less than 0.01% of people go through, but it's documented enough that there's a support group and there's people I can talk to and I can look at case studies and be like, yeah, you're not alone. Other people have had this before. I thought they were going to like take out my brain and call it like Hody syndrome, you know, after I was dead. Like, no. right. Like, or I was going to be doing things at the gym where, or things at like the circus where like I stab something through my hand and people be like, oh my gosh. And I'd be like, yeah, I'm twisting it. It feels amazing. You know, like I, I thought I was going to be a freak. And I realized, and I got some help immediately, and, and that's a whole other journey. Uh, the, your first question was where my family was in all this, and the saddest part of all of this is this was, they were they were in Colorado, I was in Utah, mm -hmm. but any of them would have done anything to help me. Right. The, the fault, 100% was on me. And I realized, and after talking to my therapist, I reached, I reached out to him, and I called him, and I remember I said, you know, I... I've been lying to you for the last five years. Um, Jamie, or, or not Jamie. Jamie's my current girlfriend. She's amazing. A fiance now. Not saying. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, Jordan and I um, were divorced. You know, we, we, wow. it, it went through. I, I lied about it until it happened. <laughs> and I called them and, and they were also very supportive. Everyone at my church was very supportive. Even everyone at my job was very supportive. It wasn't that the they weren't willing to help. It's that I wasn't willing to let them help me. Mm -hmm. I remember, um, oh man, this, this really meant a lot to me, but I remember telling my brother about it and he was so worried about me and he could tell that I was going through a hard time. And Woody um, sent me, uh, I, I love Pearls Before Swine, the comic books, uh, the comics. And he, he went out and he bought three of the treasury books and sent them to me in the mail. And I just remember like that healed me so much. Oh, wow. And all it took was him just knowing that I was hurt. And it was so important to the process. I would, I, I mean, maybe I would be alive, but I'd be that freak in the circus if I never asked for help. Mm -hmm. Right. If I just decided to tough it out. Ultimately, what it comes down to is this. And I will let you talk for a long time after this. No, Hody, it's fine. No, oh. Hody, you clearly, needed to, you clearly need a break, but you also clearly needed to talk about this. So it's all good, man. Sure. You just do what you do. Well, I mean, I, and I've talked about it. And I don't want people to think my tears like I'm still in pain. I, in fact, I mean, really, they're tears of joy because I remember what I was going through. And I'm so completely recovered now. Like, <laughs> I would help anybody. If, you're, if, if what I'm saying even resonates with you a little bit, please reach out to me because I... It heals me more to share my story and hear someone else's story. I will s share stories with anybody, even if you've only talked to me briefly or online or whatever. But ultimately what it comes down to is this. You're used to, you get used to healing yourself, which is great. You should be used to that. If you get a splinter in your finger, you should know how to take it out. If you get a burn, you should know how to put ice on it. If you get a black eye, you should know to put the raw meat on it. Self-healing is great, but at some point you're going to get cancer. And you can't heal that yourself. You can't perform your own surgery. And you just need somebody to help. The scriptures say man was not meant to, is not good for man to be alone. Man was not meant to be alone. Humans are not meant to be alone. You are not meant to fix yourself every single time. And so you want to, you can try to, but as soon as you know it's cancer, it's important to say, hey, doctor, I need a doctor. When you have a cancer in your soul, you say, I need a friend. I just need some help. I need some family, you know? And, and, and for me, that's really what it comes down to is understanding when it is actually too much. I encourage people to try and tough it out and fix themselves. I hate lily-livered people, right? I, I, I hate it when those people that, I mean, honestly, I work at a restaurant. If servers were sick every time they called in sick, they would be, I mean, that's, they call in at like leprosy rates, right? Like, we, like they're like, I've only called in sick once this week. What are you talking about? And I'm like, man, most human beings are sick maybe like three times a year, you weirdo, you know? Like, 
come on like or if at all right if at all right or even like me where you're just like well it's a headache but they invented aspirin what a great time to be alive you know so like mm-hmm. you know i still think there's an element and i wanted to give some credence to toughing it out but if you find yourself constantly toughing it out instead of asking for help you need to be able to balance those things you need to recognize the difference between saying i have a splinter and saying i have thyroid cancer because those take a different amount of people for that healing process absolutely go go ahead dale hit me with any thoughts that you had (laughs) no uh that that is a that is a jaw-dropping inspiring story and and some things that i would i would pull out of it you know just from a from an application standpoint is you know you you mentioned that the folks that you'd reached out to your family your close friends they would have they would not have thought you weak if you would have reached out to them early on. And I'm not shaming you for not reaching out. I'm just pointing it out so that people can see the, see the takeaways is that's, you know, that's the important thing Um, to relate. You mentioned scripture to relate it back to that. They talk about in in Ephesians six, they talk about the shield of faith. And so I'm going to get to a secular illustration here, but when you're in the, the shield in in roman armor was a body length that you could see over it was it covered your body length covered covered um soup to soup to your feet you know soup brain that sort of thing um and you held it on your arm you had the the gladius in your other hand you had your full full level of armor and what the romans would do when they were on an assault and taking heavy fire is they would lock their shields together both side by side and they would lock over the top now, in our culture, we're expected to be highly individualistic, highly specialized, and be able to go in there like a more modern seal and be able to handle all of our problems, which we're, we're not. And so what you're, what you're illustrating is, is the importance of locking arms with other people and being able to dodge and assault a problem that's giving you heavy fire in, in, that, in that regard. And I think, you know, so many times we forfeit the um especially as we get older sometimes we we try to forfeit that that help that that others would be able to give us because we we fear, we fear that we'd be perceived as weak now throughout my rebellion as a child i had a lot of emotional support from my other family from folks at church but i noticed just thinking about it looking back going on um as i got older the less inclined i was to to want to reach out especially being in a dorm environment, you know, you, or, you know, you're, you're around other adults or you're getting, you're, you're getting into an exclusive relationship and you don't want to seem weak to the person. Um, my, my experience with, with needing to ask for help wasn't, wasn't as extreme as, as what, what you described by any stretch. Mine manifested in more, um, in more physical ways. I was about, about two years, I would say about a year and a half ago, I was about 40 pounds overweight, um, much bigger than this, um, on the verge of diabetes. And that was as a result of, part of it was personal neglect. I mean, I was just being an idiot and drinking all the time um, and overeating and eating the wrong things. But those things tied back to the the problems that I had within myself. I, you know, even though I, there'd be times, yeah, I like myself, you know, but not really that sort of thing it was so much of that was tied back to that and it wasn't until i you know i started reaching out to folks again and realize that realizing that i was part of a a larger community even though i keep my circle my main circle small that i really started getting after this because i you know i don't want to die when i'm 60 like like my biological father did you know i want to be able to you know I want to be able to live. I still want to be able to do things. I'm only 38. I should still be able to at least, you know, walk a flight of stairs without losing my breath, that sort of thing. But it's, and I don't necessarily, well, I'll just go ahead and say what I'm going to say. If, you know, if you're having some, some sort of an issue, you need to reach out, even if it's, you know, you don't want to be, you don't want to be like the person in the, in the classroom who's, who may need the help, but they're just constantly getting it all over other people. Um, but at the same time, if it's serious, you need to you need to reach out. If someone wrongs you, you need to confront them about it. Even if you're not, even if you're not doing it in a confrontational way, you just say, "Hey, listen, I didn't like the way you said that to me." You know, keeping you know trying to keep short accounts with people. And then if you you got somebody that doesn't doesn't want to keep accounts with you, you just let them go. You cut them loose. Um, 
Well, I am, I am, insp- I have to say, I don't, I, I have very little to say at this point because I'm just, I'm, I'm a, I'm not aghast in a, in a judgmental way, but I'm, I'm both awed and inspired because, you know, so many times it's, we don't think that the, that other people in our lives are willing to help, but yeah, if you're, if you're hurting and you can't do anything else, you need to, you need to drop what you're doing and, and reach out to someone and, and, try to address the issues, whether it's a therapist or even just a family member. I mean, that's where you gotta, that's where you gotta go is taking the first step is talking to somebody, lock shields, hunker down and, and get after those problems. Yeah. The, the, it's healing for both people to help. I think one of the things that I found now is that I just, I so want somebody else to be like, yeah, hey, I'm going through something and be like, man, you want to swap swap stories, you know, oh, yeah. kind of the whole grade school. I know this is gross, but the whole I'll show you yours if you show me mine, you know, I'll show you mine if you show me yours type of thing. I never did that. That's very gross when talking about the physical body. But as far as when we talk about like your, your souls, or your emotions, I think that's a very healthy thing to do is to say you know, you don't want to have necessarily that one-sided relationship either way, where you're either be, being the person unloading all the baggage or you're the person, you know, receiving all the baggage, you know, <laughs> it, it, you feel a bit guilty almost, you know, I pride myself on being surrounded with strong, you know, strong people that, and, and I think it's a very masculine thing. And this is where we talk about the benefits and the drawbacks to be like, I'm tough, I'm a man. But none of us will ever share the problems in our lives that we're having. You know, we want to pretend that we got it handled, right? When nobody's got it handled, man, nobody's an island, you know? God made Adam and the whole Garden of Eden and everything pretty much perfect and still realized Adam was a miserable SOB on his own, you know? So, like, what? I mean, we got Adam and Eve, and how many times do we have an Adam and an Eve that are, like, supposed to be together and sharing problems and going through all their difficulties, but they choose to be separate, right? We just say, well, Eve says she's got it all handled, and Adam says he's got it all handled. That's just pride, right? Like, that's just that's just problematic pride. And that's when you, and that's a sin, right? That's actually a deadly sin that's a core sin so you're no longer toughing it out you've actually embraced the wickedness that is pride in saying that oh i don't need help i'm my own man you know and 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 again that you should recognize the healthy things that come with being like hey i you know i fought for these things i think it's important that we struggle that we fight you know that we tough it out that i say yeah it's a little hiccup this morning but nothing that's going to derail me uh, I find that, you know, kind of a healthy gateway is just being honest. You know, if somebody's like, hey, how are you? I'd be like, dude, straight up, my life is great. But I burned my finger like two weeks ago and the skin's coming off right here. And it just sucks to touch everything with my right thumb. Right. And is life still great? Absolutely. But at least you could just be like, eh, you know, and sometimes you force yourself to do it. I really love, there's a point, uh, part early on in Mere Christianity where C.S. Lewis talks about uh, a study that was performed when they said, you know, smile even if you're feeling sad. And you, people will find that even by pretending to, you pretend to smile for long enough, you'll eventually smile, right? right. Like you'll eventually crack a real smile. And... I don't want that to be, I think I used to interpret that verse to say, well, mask all your true feelings if you're really sad or whatever. But I think Mm -hmm. there is a time, if you find yourself miserable about everything, it's time to get some pro help. You should try to be happy. You should still make that your goal. I think some people, they have the goal to wallow in sadness and find other people to share it with. Mm -hmm. That's a bad goal, right? Your goal should be to be happy. And I think the C.S. Lewis thing always helped because when you do, when I do smile, And you say, you know, I'm just going to, at first it's forced, but eventually it becomes natural. And you find yourself smiling because you like to smile because it feels better than frowning. You may have have a natural frown, but you force yourself to smile for a little bit. And after a while, you're like, oh, okay, I get this. You know, still never betray your inner emotions, you know, be level when things are problematic. And I think put it all in perspective for yourself. I think for me, One of the man, I know one of the big things that kept me from whining was because I know there's people starving to death Mm -hmm. and my problems are not that and I am not being persecuted and I am not dealing with this. The thing is, is your your brain evolves, your brain adjusts as you grow and says, 
Well, I'm used to all this. For me, all my support mechanisms were in Jordan, were in my ex-wife. All of them. Every single one. And so when all those were robbed from me, my brain first had to, I mean, I went through the stages of grief, but denial was years, right? And wow. was just like, yeah, pretend that everything's still working because that's the only way my brain can make it work is to pretend that we're going to be okay because that's all of my support mechanisms. I needed... The healthy thing to do is have a bunch, as many support mechanisms as you can, you know? Mm -hmm. You have many friends, many relationships, many groups, many activities, many hobbies. And, and I had hobbies, but they were because Jordan liked them. And I had, you know, restaurants I liked, but it's because Jordan liked them. And I had friends, but it was because they were the friends that Jordan wanted me to make. You know, it wasn't... You know what I'm saying? And she wasn't intentionally that controlling. That's just what I did because I wanted to make her happy. She, she is not to blame for her being all of my support mechanisms. Truthfully, she probably would have liked me better had I decided to branch out and have other means of support as opposed to her being my my whole world. You know what I mean? Like, so she that's not her fault. That's just me, you know? But I think you got to put it in perspective. If all of your support mechanisms go out regardless of whether you are starving to death or being prosecuted, you know, persecuted, prosecuted, persecuted for your religion or whatever. Yeah. Prosecuted guilty of your religion. Uh, whatever it may be, it, it it's all really the same level upstairs in your head, you know, and really that's what you gotta, gotta compare it with. I think the funny thing is, is I would have, I mean, and I know, and I can just tell you straight up, I would have traded my leg. I would have traded my hands, my head. I would have traded my life. I, I would have preferred death. I, only reason I didn't commit suicide is because I thought it was a sin, right? Like, or I didn't want to go to hell or something. Well, you were going to, the, the idea is in that, in that regard is that in the, in the Christian tradition, it's worse than what you're going through. If you do that, that's <laughs> right. The fear of that is basically what kept me from doing it. At that point, I had stopped caring about heaven and just wanted to avoid hell and was like, that's really the only thing that's keeping me around at this point. But I would have I would have taken anything as opposed to going through the divorce. So really what my brain was doing is saying, man, famine, persecution for my faith, like getting shot in the leg. All that sounds great compared to what I'm deal to my divorce, what I'm dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. to what you know and so whether you know some people i, I saw this with women a lot when i was at the hospital and i know we're about closing time here but no it's fine i still want to give you even before final thoughts i still want to go another round here but i i know i saw this at the hospital was women would give them a heart themselves a hard time in the psych word about going through serious mental problems after having a miscarriage because mm -hmm. it it is common it enough i guess as a medical terms it happens often and but they still feel bad and they're saying well you know and, and the medical way to deal with it is like you shouldn't feel bad lots of women are going through this well sometimes that makes you feel worse because you're like well I'm, I'm barely holding it together and apparently everybody else is doing just fine everybody's not doing just fine they're faking it you know and and there are many people and you would be surprised when you open up and share your story about the hurt that you went through about how many other people are doing it Postpartum depression is super real. Um, my current fiance went through it. And a lot of people think like, what, that's insane. I would never dream of hurting my kids. And then you find, you know, 5 million case studies of women who struggle with postpartum depression, you know? So it's not like, you might feel like I shouldn't be struggling with it. But if you're struggling with it, just be open, be honest, get help, reach out. Again, you know, if it's something that you know you can tough out and you're going to be fine in an hour or two, great. But if it's if you are feeling seriously hurt, don't tell yourself you should feel differently because that's just not going to work. You will get to a very dark place. You know, if you just say, oh, I shouldn't be hurting right now, that doesn't change the hurt that there is. Be honest with it. Be open with it. Own it and talk with other people about it and just figure out what you need to do for help. No, I, I would I would totally I would totally agree with that. Um with all of it because you have to 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 make it i guess to make it practical obviously if you're in a working environment where you have to put on a tough face put on that tough face and and be selective yeah don't don't worry about that that i sent you i was an idiot um <laughs> hurtful anyway. no i didn't know i was being an idiot because i was i wasn't sure of what was going on with the thing but now i'm breaking the fourth wall 
So the first thing, if you need to put it, put forth a tough, tough face for your working environment, by all means do that. And if you know there's folks that you trust, by all means, tell them what's going on immediately. Um, don't let it get to the point where you're either grossly overweight like I was, or when you're when you're starting to feel numb. I mean, especially if you have a catac, you wanna you wanna cultivate the network of friends before you have a cataclysm like a divorce or this or that or or whatever it is that 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 pulls you into the underworld as as Jordan Peterson would say. Um, that's the first thing you want to do is you know reach out. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting all over the map here. Um, put on a tough face if you have to for work, but then behind the scenes, share it with folks as appropriate. Get a professional because they'll help you sort it out better than your friends can. And when you're looking at your friends, you want to make sure you vet them before you share the issue. And here's why. Um, sometimes misery is just looking for company. You're going to tell somebody something and then they're going to go on about their problems rather than you know, building a bridge with their humanity and empathetically listening. They're going to, you know, it's just going to be a, be a miserable, be a miserableness fest. I don't know. Um, you don't want people necessarily enabling your damage, but you want folks who are going to validate it and, and help you push and help you push through it, if that makes sense. And then, um, you know, I'm trying to think of, of other of other practicals along those lines, but those would be the things. Be selective. Uh, you know, if you're if you're close to your family, tell your family. If you have to tell your boss what's going on, pull them into the office and say, "Hey, listen, this is what's going on. You know, I may need, you know, day off, or if I'm a little off, this is why. This is what I'm going through. You want to, uh, and I emphasize the protocol and sharing it appropriately because you don't want to be the per. You don't want to. I'll just call her Melissa. You don't want to be Melissa, the person who's, and if there's anybody listening whose name's Melissa, don't get offended. I'm referring to a specific person that I went to high school with, <laughs> but who's, who's constantly a drag on the ship and, you know, causing problems. You want to make sure you do it appropriately. Um, and then if nothing, and if nothing else, you know, read good books, talk to yourself like you're someone you need to care about and, and press on. You can be tough while being vulnerable, and that's fine. So, that those are my final thoughts. I'll let I'll I'll kick it back to you, Hody. I think I've kind of hashed it out. I think being vulnerable sometimes is the one of the toughest things that you can do. You know, yeah. it's you think you're being tough by postponing cancer's treatments, right? But then you realize, oh, the cancer's taking over my whole body. I'm just making it worse. You're not tough. You're stupid, you know? And, and in one sense, you're afraid to face those fears. So there's nothing tough about that. You're afraid to share your personal experiences. So you're not tough, you know? You're afraid. You don't want to break, break decorum. You don't want to break the status quo, you know? All these terrible things like that. And so, you know, I, I think, and I do want to lend a kin. I, I feel like I'm paying it just lip service. Man, toughing out is so cool. Like, if you really are the strong type of person who just says, yeah, I burned breakfast, but I don't, when people ask me how I'm doing, I don't talk about my burned breakfast because I'm doing great. That was just a stupid burned breakfast. You know, I think we all know people who you are... breakfast this morning, Hody? Uh, can you tell? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> but you could tell, like, these people who are, who, who are emotional wrecks, and, you know, they kind of build their house on the sand, so to speak. And you just kind of say, well, everything wrecks your world. You're like, you feel like your whole life is bad. You know, you, you can't get there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's also bad, right? If you're in a place where you're just like, oh, yeah, e every little thing that happens to me is bad. Now, if you do feel that way, I don't want you to feel tacked, but you should definitely get help because you do need more support mechanisms in your life. If the if you have enough pain, if there if the all it takes is a burned breakfast or spilled milk, so to speak, to make you cry because you are lacking enough support in order to, and maybe we can talk about support and pain mechanisms in a different episode or something. Cause I'm, I'm super all about those, but if you don't have enough supporting things in your life that it's a bad day when something little happens, it's time to fix your day. It's time to fix your lifestyle. You know, you're, you're going to need to, you're going to have to make some huge changes. And so I do, I did want to pay more than just lip service to toughing it out. 
Mm. Obviously, I've talked about asking for help and the importance of that. I think that if you've listened to this point, you understand how that important how important that is. But you know, do do become tough if you can. You know, be strong. Uh, there was a TED talk that talked about how the number one indicator among the Forbes 500 isn't educator education, isn't uh, money, isn't family relations. It's not even personal relations. It's grit. And I think grit is a great characteristic. So develop you some grit so that you can take a few hits and stay in the ring. You know, I I, I uh, used to manage a Buffalo Wild Wings, and uh, thank goodness that's done. But I loved Fight Night. I loved watching them. And I remember the mind-blowing thing about Fight Night is you'll see somebody who's able to take a few hits, and they'll be lose. They'll just be getting hit the entire time. But the other guy will wear out by pu- by punching him, but he can take it. And then a couple whacks, it's over. The other guy's on his back. He won, and you're just like, that guy can take a bunch of hits. You know, I guess I thought he was just losing, but he was letting the other guy tire him out. Like, it's crazy. And you want to be that type of person that can take a few pit punches that says, eh, it's a hit here, it's a hit there. There's enough sturdiness in the heart and in my head that I know I'm okay. You know, and so definitely be like that. I definitely want to make sure that I get that point across too. I'm not trying to create a whole generation of namby pambies. You know, be tough, be strong. But recognize that it is super, one of the strongest things you can do is be like, hey, I, I'm really good at lifting 100 pounds over my head, but I just got asked to lift 500 pounds over my head. I'm going to need to pull in some help on this one, and that's totally cool. That's why we have other people on this earth, you guys. No man's an island, and no man's meant to be an island. And the people who do want to be islands, go live on an island. You know, and, and and nobody does because it's not fun. It's not a good way to live. We're a social people. But uh, Dale, I'll let you wrap it up, my friend. The one thing that I was thinking about while while listening to you was one of the keys to to dealing with with adversity is voluntarily taking it on, accepting it as part of as part of it, as part of your life. Now, that doesn't mean you just not do anything about it, but it it. Uh, what what am I looking for? It takes the edge off of it if you vol- if you if you don't emotionally deny what's going on. If you voluntarily take it on as as a project, or you voluntarily take on suffering, um, that's that is a a theme throughout many traditions. If you learn to do that, that can be a first step as well. But again, I'll just reiterate: I'm being a broken record. Uh, reach out to to those closest to you that you trust. If you, even if you're not as far, even if you're not that far down the road, you're just, you're just feeling a lot of darkness. Feel free to reach out to your friends. Even if you're like, man, I feel this way, but I don't know what the, what the heck's going on. I gotta, I gotta watch my language in case my mom's listening, but, uh, but feel free to reach out to others and, and band together. That's the best that that's the, I think that's the best thing we can pull from this voluntarily take on suffering and, band together with uh, with others as appropriate so with that that's my final thought all right thank you again patreon listeners appreciate it appreciate oh, your am support. i supposed to do the outro yeah 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 oh i'm uh, sorry well thank you again patreon listeners get it on uh google get us on google play stitcher and uh itunes and all those other platforms check us out on the patreon i don't know the link again so you go ahead and say the patreon link cody uh patreon.com slash we are libertarians there you go and dale did you get did you get your wall reader i haven't yet i want to you and i are both published if you didn't get the wall reader guys so the the printed copies we're working on that we had the you can still view it for free wallreader.com w-a-l reader.com real easy you can see all our articles you can get it on Kindle. You can actually, I just looked on Kindle. You can get it for free on Kindle and you can pay for it to get it downloaded, but you can view it on Kindle if that's how you like to view it. Uh, but you can get an actual physical copy of our journal, the wall journal. Our journal. Ryan Lindsay crushed it. Like this thing looks like, I, I've gotten journals from like Fee and Reason and stuff like that. This is right on par with like mainstream, like this is quality, you know? I'll be the first to admit my my podcast isn't as high grain and definition or whatever is as you know what Foxes or CBSs would would expect. You don't want to be like those people, Hody Johns. Oh, but Ryan, it, I mean that that journal looks legit, and I'm just gonna say uh, that I'm look I'm already looking forward to episode two. But WallReader.com, go ahead, keep 
Finish. Finish. End it. Wallreader.com. If you want to get more of me, simplisticadvice.com. But most importantly, we are libertarians.com. We are libertarians forward slash Patreon. It's somewhere on there. And uh, Hoodie Johns, thanks again for, for having us. Thank you for sharing your heart. Uh, inspiring and and yeah, inspiring. That's all I'll say, man. You have yeah. a good night. You too, man. Uh, thanks for sharing your story. You're just less wimpy than I am. <laughs> no, no, I'm, not. I'm a wimp. Kisses. All right. Get out of here. No, no kisses. Ugh.